Over to you, uh, King Sun. Yeah, well, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, part two of a three-part series. All right. Uh, the title of this section is uh, Disciplining the People, uh, the creation of the strong state of Singapore, but did it actually produce a weak people? So this is the question that I think uh, we should be concerned about. Uh, let me just quickly summarize. Part one, uh, I started by uh, talking about the end of World War II, uh, highlighting the Yalta Conference in 1945 that led to the world under American hegemony, right? America, uh, Roosevelt actually told Churchill, you know, you got to, you got to decolonize all your colonies because uh, uh, we are taking over. And Churchill had to agree because Churchill was, uh, Britain was bankrupt. <laughs> they had owed so much money to America because America paid for the war effort uh, against uh, Nazi Germany, right? And immediately after that, the Cold War came about. The Russians, uh, Soviet Union, were challenging the American order. And then in the process of decolonization, uh, Malaysia was created. And, uh, and then in 65, we, we left Malaysia. And that's when Lee Kuan Yew cried, you see. And I explained why he cried uh, in, the, in the first part. Uh, because without Malaysia as a hinterland, economic hinterland, uh, Singapore had to become the global city. So part two begins here, right? So this is the, how do I scroll? Uh, this is the Yalta conference, right? Sitting in the middle is uh, Roosevelt. That's uh, uh, Winston Churchill. And that is uh, Stalin, which is the, the head of the uh, Russian uh, so Union of Soviet Socialist uh, Republics, USSR. Right. So 1945, Yellow Conference determined what the world was going to be after World War II. All right. So part two, the present. Uh, the question that I'm asking, I'm not a historian, so I'm just asking a whole series of questions, right? Uh, did Lee Kuan Yew uh, stress on the strong government and did that stress in the, in the end unintendedly weaken the people, right? Because Lee Kuan Yew had to do the impossible, no? After we left Malaysia, no hinterland, right? We had to uh, find our way uh, uh, to, to become a global city, right? So this is the, 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 the requirement, right? And to survive economically, we have to discipline the people so that they become hardworking but obedient. And uh, because this is required by the foreign investors, you know, because they do not want to see uh, labor unrest. They don't want to see students uh, marching up and down the road. They do not want to see racial conflict or anything like that. So, so the disciplining process uh, uh, took place. I will describe later on in de greater detail how the disciplining process uh, uh, took place. Right. And the, the important question which I want to say right up front here is that regarding disciplining, might there come a time when the disciplining actually becomes dysfunctional? Because if we are going to move into the next fu the future, we need a much more creative people, much more courageous people, much more imaginative, much more with much more initiative, you know. So the, the kind of di disciplining that, that is going on right now may, may be dis dysfunctional in the future. So that will be discussed later on. So now let's start with the uh, the first phase of this of this uh, part two, right? That is the appointment of Dr. Win Semias, right? This is the economics advisor that helped the PAP government in the 60s and 70s to frame the industrialization policy, the economic policy, the educational policy, the social policy, everything, right? And uh, the, he and he worked very closely with the PAP leadership, Lee Kuan Yew in particular, and Go King Sui and so on. And uh, he, he actually set out the framework for the, for the Singapore success uh, after uh, uh, we became independent, right? But the, the, the question which uh, I have always asked myself is that why Winston Mills? Winston Mills is a rather more conservative, uh, uh, liberal, uh, democratic, uh, politi political, uh, kind of mindset, you know, 
because there was the other alternative that is a Guna Madal, right? This is Guna Madal. He wrote this very important book called Asian Drama. He spent a lot of time in Asia studying the causes of poverty in Asia. So he's a man who has who has a deep understanding of uh, uh, the, the the socioeconomic conditions in Asia, and um, he would have become he would have been a very much more suitable person, in my opinion, uh, to to be an advisor to Singapore rather than Winston Mears. But unfortunately, he he uh, I think he was a, a bit left wing because he attended the uh, 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 1955 Bandung Conference, right? of non-aligned nations, which was held in Bandung, organized by uh, uh, Sukarno, and uh, uh, was also uh, backed by uh, uh, Chu Ying Lai, right? So this is a, uh, clearly a kind of a, a independent a, a, a movement trying to, be, trying to free itself from Western domination. And this is, of course, not acceptable. So I, I think because of that, Guna Mandal was uh, was not considered right. Now, so after Singapore left Malaysia in sixty five, we had no more hinterland. So, uh, Rajaratnam, the great wordsmith of Singapore, was able to coin the the wonderful concept called Singapore, the global city, right? Because we lost uh, Malaysia as our hinterland. Now he's arguing, and, 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 and Lee Kuan Yew also amplified it, that the world is now our hinterland. Wow, this is a very, very uh, catching uh, uh, concept, right? So the question that, that, that arises, I, I ask this question, was the global city concept just a nice way of saying what it really is, that we have to become a servant to the West? Without a hinterland, Singapore had now to fully serve the new Western global order under American, uh, under the Anglo-American order, right? So, in the new global order in Southeast Asia, uh, the question that I raise is, is, is the new global order in Southeast Asia now finally the outcome of uh, uh, Frederick Hayek's uh, 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 prodigy, Milton Friedman, who was the American uh, professor of e economics in uh, uh, University of Chicago, right? Uh, who proposed, who really formulated the idea of neoliberalism. That is to say that, that, that capitalism, right, must be the, 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 the principal economic order, right? With as little interference from government uh, as, as much as possible. In part one, I, I discussed this, uh, this, this concept uh, by referring to uh, 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 this uh, uh, German, uh, Austrian German uh, uh, sociologist and philosopher. Um, uh, what is his name now? <laughs> yeah, who wrote this important book called The Great Transformation, where he said that uh, marketization, that is capitalism, uh, must be balanced by social protection. And I think this is a, a philosophy that uh, the, the early PAP leaders right, uh, all believe in, right? Because I think we do not want to have a completely uh, 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 top-down economic system that exploited the labor to the extreme, right? So there must be social protection. We must have housing. We must have health services. We must have uh, 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 better infrastructure. Right, we must have good schools and so on and so forth. So this is the 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 the, the early PAP philosophy. But the moment we have to become a global city, then I think we have to uh, think a lot more about the return on investment, right? The, the 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 monetary policy, right? So every every calculation in terms of social benefit must be accompanied by uh, a cost benefit analysis, right? So that. Uh, uh, in, in increasingly, monetization became more and more uh, the main main important thing. So this diagram about the global order under American order is uh, basically symbol symbolizes uh, this this new reality in which global city is thrust into that right. So this is uh, Milton Fried uh, 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 Friedman, uh, who is a very influential uh, economist, and he influenced the Republican Party and all the all the uh, 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 
liberal capitalist uh, forces in the United States, right? Milton Friedman uh, was required reading for all members of the Republican Party. Okay, so Milton Friedman was an ardent follower of Hayek, right? Who 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 wrote this very important book about uh, uh, criticizing socialism that it is the road to serve them, right? Because uh, he was a uh, very concerned about the, the, the impact of the Soviet Socialist uh, re Republic, which would uh, uh, turn all the people into the slaves of the state. No? The state was the, was the final authority, was the, which decided on the, uh, the economy, who gets what, when and how, and so on and so forth. So this is the, 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 the new order that uh, uh, came, came into, into existence, right? And, and Singapore will just thrust right into that. The philosophy being that if you have a very powerful economy, uh, the, the rich will, of course, get very rich, but there will be a trickle-down effect, right? So that as, as, as the economy grows, right, the, the GDP grows, then uh, there will be better jobs, people will get some uh, uh, higher pay, right? The, the labor unions would be uh, disciplined in such a way that they do not uh, uh, go on strike easily, right? And uh, so there would be a tripartite arrangement, right? So th that's what we have now, right? You have the NTUC, uh, you have the, the Employers Federation, and then you have the government, right? The three-corner thing, right? And they decide, right, uh, on the wages policy, right? So we have this, uh, the... The father-in-law of uh, Lee Sen Yang, right, who, who's, whose daughter married uh, Lee Sen Yang, right, became uh, uh, Lim Chong Ya, Professor Lim Chong Ya, was the chairman of the of the uh, Wages Council for, for for many many years, and he determined uh, uh, the the right level of, of 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 pay that people should get, and and also factored in the interests of the investors, and also the government had a. Uh, played a balancing role to make sure that uh, things don't go uh, lopsided, okay? So, the big question is, in 1968, by 1960, you see, between 1965, we had this crisis, we had to go become a global city, then uh, by 1968, uh, already uh, the, the trend towards uh, economic uh, uh, stabilization was already taking effect, right? And so the question that I ask is, is this, why did uh, Lee Kuan Yew shift away from his own Fabian socialism, which was center-left position, right, to the new liberal center-right position? Was it after his three, he spent three months in Harvard Kennedy School in 1968, right? Um, I have asked some friends who were in uh, uh, Harvard Kennedy School at that time. Um, he was uh, very interested in finding economic arguments, which obviously he had with uh, uh, Go King Sui. King Sui is definitely a liberal left, you see, right? Uh, a, a kind of Fabian socialist, uh, a liberal socialist uh, approach, right? And he wanted to out talk uh, 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 Go King Sui. So, this is what my friends in Harvard tell me that that was the real reason why. Kuan Yu went to Harvard because he wanted to learn the language of, of, uh, of this course against the liberal uh, democratic uh, model which uh, Keng Sui was ad advocating. And that is, and it was also there that, uh, well, he spent a, a whole semester in Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, so the question that, that arises is that what did he bring back from there, right? And this is what he brought back, right? He, he, he made the his best friend in America, uh, Henry Kissinger, who just died in, in, at age one hundred. Right, um, he became a buddy of of, of Henry, and when uh, Kuan Yu passed away, Henry diverted his uh, trip back to America from China. He was in China at the time, and he diverted his trip and came to pay respects to uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. And whenever Kuan Yew went to America. He would actually spend time with uh, Henry, right? And now that uh, Henry has passed away, there are a lot of discussions now about uh, uh, Henry. You see, we all have a very good op opinion of Henry because Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, together with uh, Richard Nixon, helped to uh, bring China 
in, in, in into the uh, international fold, right? In I think 1960, 1971 or 72, right? He made the trip, he met uh, 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 Mao Zedong and then they opened up, right? And uh, America was, uh, and then eventually China joined the WTO and became a, a very successful economic power, right? But there are other aspects of, of, of Henry Kissinger that we, we don't want to know, right? For example, uh, he was a very close confidant of uh, uh, Tricky Dick. Right? That, that was the, the name that was given to uh, Richard Nixon, right? N Nixon uh, was not a, a, a straight player, right? He was a bit of a tricky guy, you know? Uh, and between him and Henry, they, they did a lot of things, right? For example, the bombing of Vietnam, the bombing of Cambodia uh, and Laos uh, was all done secretly, right? Uh, uh, Congress that was never informed about the, the, the bombing, right? Henry did did all the all the uh, uh, instructions to the to the to, to the Pentagon forces, the CIA forces, and so on. And Henry was also responsible for many of the atrocities, right? For example, he uh, he supplied all the weapons to uh, the Indonesian uh, uh, army, right? Who who did a lot of atrocities in East Timor, right? And he was uh, fully in support of that, right? And he was also uh, finance, financially supporting the uh, General Pinochet in, uh, in Chile, right? Who then overthrew the elected uh, 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 president of uh, Chile, right? At that time, a, a kind of leftist socialist uh, guy. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, Allende, uh, who was the elected president, uh, uh, was, uh, was, was died in the process of the of the of the coup d'état by by the by the uh, Chilean army supported by CIA under the instruction of Henry. So Henry is not an innocent guy, you know. So the other name that uh, this, that Henry has been given is that uh, you know a uh, uh, killer killer Kissinger in cahoots with Tricky Dick, right? So these are the two guys, right? Like, okay. So that that that's a bit bit of a story. <laughs> And uh, this is uh, Lee Kuan Yew's uh, 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 observation of the Americans that they are great missionaries. They are uh, proselytizers of democracy and capitalism against communism and so on and so forth. And they, they have an irrepressible urge to, to convert others. You know, you, you come to our point of view or else, right? Because or else was, uh, uh, I mean, it's well, well documented in this book by by uh, uh, John uh, Perkins, right? Confessions of an Economic Hitman, right? right. So when you are faced with uh, 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 Henry, uh, with uh, John Perkins, right? You are given uh, a huge pile of money on one hand and a bullet on the other hand, you choose. <laughs> so that is how it's done, right? And, and then of course, the reality is this, this is the American uh, uh, military bases, the 800 military bases all over the world. This is the American order of which we are part, part of, right? We cannot ignore the fact that the American uh, uh, economic, uh, diplomatic, and military forces are overarching the entire world. Uh, you cannot ignore that. So that's why I raised the question in, uh, in part one, right? are we independent? I, uh, and, and the kind of independence that we have uh, is, is uh, within this context, right? You cannot, act, act, yeah. And, and people like to think that you know we are such a uh, an independent little red dot right we are not we are we are little red dot no doubt but it's a red dot under this umbrella this global uh, 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 military economic and uh, political umbrella okay so why then did Lee Kuan Yew admire these people right these are the people right you have uh, Hayek on the left right you have Milton Friedman you have uh, Ronald Reagan and you have Margaret Thatcher. These are all the extreme right wing of the uh, of the political and economic spectrum, right? So he was greatly in, in admiration of these people, right? Despite the fact that when he was in Britain, uh, he was a Fabian socialist, right? And uh, his his old buddies in the Malayan Forum, right? Lee Kuan, uh, uh, Go Keng Sui, uh, Raj, uh, Rajaratnam, To Chin Chai. Uh, we all they were all liberal uh, um, uh, liberal Democrats uh, slightly left wing yeah 
So, and and this is how the neoliberal ideology under the American umbrella, right, uh, has so influenced the world that now, I think most of our sort of post-colonial world believes that the West is best, right? So this is the the kind of uh, writing of, of the of the uh, mental landscape, right? The, the creation of the mental landscape that uh, the whole world uh, is under, and this is uh, uh, very clear, right? The West is best, right? So that's why every building in the in our Singapore downtown is designed by a American architect to make our city look like a, a bit of America, see, right? So this is, uh, and in fact, Lee Kuan Yew himself in, himself actually said that. We must make our city uh, look very, very familiar and uh, 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 acceptable to our foreign investors, so that they feel comfortable. See, so that so the westernization of our entire uh, urban landscape uh, is is in line with the West is best. Yeah. So neoliberalism, uh, right? Uh, the question that uh, is now right uh, now arising, right? In fact, after the the 2008 uh, financial crisis in the Wall Street, right? Uh, I think the whole idea that uh, the trickle down of wealth uh, promised by neoliberal neoliberalism, right, is actually uh, uh, flawed, right? So here is a uh, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, buddy of uh, Margaret Thatcher, right, Prime Minister of Britain, right, and here is he with uh, Ronald Reagan, right? So. Was there a growing ideological, this is a question, was there a growing ideological difference between Lee Kuan Yew and Go Keng Sui over Lee's, Lee Kuan Yew's shift towards the right of centre while Go Keng Sui remained somewhat left of centre? So this is the, the kind of question which uh, our historians have not actually fully uh, uh, discussed, right? So the, the official or the normal narrative of Singapore history uh, I think needs to, to to address this question. You know, was there a shift? What was the what what actually happened? What are the elements of this shift from left to right? Okay. So, this book uh, uh, on the in lieu of ideology of Bo Keng Sui, right? That is very important book, right? Uh, the question that arises is that Lee Kuan Yew, uh, uh, Bo Keng Sui actually retired uh, from politics in nineteen eighty four. And did he retire because of his differences with Lee? So I don't know. This is a, a topic which I think needs to be explored by our journalist friends and as well as our historians and so on, right? I'm sure there are documents uh, uh, all over the place, but they're not easy to get to, all right? Okay. So, back to 1965, right? Did... America deposed Sukarno's left-leaning policy because Sukarno was kind of uh, forming his, his kind of coalition with uh, the PKI, the Party Communist Indonesia, the the the, the Muslim uh, 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 groups, right, Muhammadiyah, and so on, and uh, he was uh, kind of trying to play a balancing role, but he was, in the view of the of the of the Anglo-American order, right, kind of. Uh, playing a dangerous game, right? Right. So, 1965 was a very important year because there was a coup d'etat, right? Uh, I think what seven gen seven of the generals were were, were murdered, right? Uh, America uh, was had a hand in it, right? Uh, there are lots of stories now, right? And and uh, uh, I don't want to go into detail, but um, uh, America was very happy with this this thing, right? And and Kissinger had uh, was was very very supportive, right, of the Western intervention, right? How how the inter intervention took place? There are a lot of details which are, we are we don't know. So there is this in, important uh, book and film, right? The Killing Season, right? About one million people, that's the estimate, were killed in the in in Indonesia, right? Uh, of course, many of the 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 communist elements, the PKI, were immediately killed. But a lot of the their, their supporters and their uh, fringe uh, 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 friends and so on, particularly among the the, the Chinatown, uh, uh, Jakarta Chinatown, the the Chinatown in uh, in, in in Surabaya, 
in Medan, right? They were also killed, right? And so the money, so there was a there, there was a flood of Indonesian Chinese money uh, uh, flying in large amounts into Singapore Bank to escape the 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 Indonesian uh, uh, conflict that was going on, right? Uh, and then, of course, later on also, there was another conflict in 1998, which came about as a result of the 1997 uh, currency crisis, right? And, and, and money was, uh, was, uh, was uh, very, very tight and, and people were very upset, right? So 1965, uh, Sukarno was kicked out and Sohato came in. But 1998, Sohato was kicked out, right? And uh, a new set of uh, Indonesian leaders came in, right? Prabowo, uh, Prabowo, and uh, uh, quite a few others, right? Okay. So what happened? 1968, the URA in Singapore started to sell land sites, sites, uh, sites, right? Why was that to soak up the money that was uh, lying idle in our banks, right? So, so this is People's Park Complex, right? A project which I did, right? Uh, the, the the a lot of developers were able to get very very low interest loans, uh, very relaxed uh, uh, loan uh, uh, requirements, right? So Singapore benefited from the, the the Indonesian money that was lying in Singapore. So you can see that that um, uh, in a in a sense the global city concept, right? Meant meant that uh, that the, the 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 Singapore economy was an open economy, right? So money from, from all kinds of places were able to come through to Singapore, right? And Singapore provided the kind of safe haven, right? A reliable uh, political environment, right? Uh, a, a conducive environment for investment, right? Which was, which was ensured by the, the PAP uh, government disciplining of the environment of the society and so on. So money was, uh, was flowing in from all directions, right? And that was how... Singapore uh, was able to develop very fast because we had a lot of capital resources, right? So things like the, you know, uh, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, huge developments uh, happened all over Singapore, right? Okay. Now, and then Lee Kuan Yew said that to make our foreign investors feel comfortable, right? Was that why most of Singapore's downtown buildings were designed by American and other Western architects? So this is the uh, you see the, the the cash flow that came through right was because people with money could trust the Singapore political system because it was a safe place right so recently we have this uh, uh, case of uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, black money coming into Singapore right and then they were arrested right I think about 2.4 billion dollars or something like that so Singapore it comes to a Zurich of Asia, right? We have become a major uh, uh, financial center for for uh, money flows, right? And and of course, uh, uh, also you know this this Western is West is best thing also affects even even the uh, uh, preservation of historical buildings, right? All these shop houses, right? It was to preserve it because in 1984 the Pata Conference, right? The Pacific Air Travel Association, right? came to have a conference in Singapore and basically said to the Singapore government and the tourism board, right, that uh, our, our tourists are who, who, tourists come to Singapore not to see all your new buildings, no, they come to see your old buildings. So that is how the, the, the Singapore immediately responded, you see. And then URA then began to preserve all these old, old shop houses and old buildings. So you see, we are, we are an open society. We are an open economy. We respond always. We respond well to international uh, requirements and so on, right? So the question that uh, that we need to ask ourselves is that, does that strengthen us or does it weaken us? And here's another case, right? 1971, I as a young uh, 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 aero modeler was very enthused with this kind of aeroplane, right? The Delta Wing, uh, 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 what is it called, this, this aircraft? Uh, Vulcan, Vulcan, right? Was based in Singapore. And, and and it's a it's a strategic long distance bomber, but that is that's something which we, we we did not know until recently, right? That it was to, it was carrying uh, 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 atomic bombs, flying regularly between Singapore and Hong Kong, Singapore and Hong Kong, in order to send the signal to China that we can bomb you, right? 
But the moment it came to 1976, when uh, 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 China exploded their first uh, atomic bomb in the uh, Gobi Desert in the north, right? Suddenly, uh, this idea of, of threatening uh, China from Singapore using the Vulcan uh, strategic bomber and nu nuclear bomb and so on. We had a lot of nuclear bombs stored in Singapore. <laughs> we, we, none of us knew it. Yeah. And then, therefore, it was no longer necessary because the, the, the whole strategic uh, 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 envelope of uh, 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 mil military uh, strategic uh, encirclement of China took on a whole different uh, dimension already, right? Okay, so that is it. So as a result of it, uh, uh, the bomber was no longer necessary, right? Uh, China exploded its own bombs, right? So that is the reason why the British bases were handed over to Singapore. Because there was no more need for it. Because the whole strategic uh, configuration of the world had changed, right? The, the US 7th Fleet was easily moving around, right? Guam was a major uh, 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 military base for America, right? It had a lot of uh, uh, military assets in Philippines, right? And so on. So, so, and also in Thailand. So, the whole strategic game has changed, right? Okay. So, the question again, our, our historical documents uh, narrative does not tell us what, what were the quid pro quo? For the handover of British bases, we are told that they were handed over almost free, right? But uh, what is what was what was the deal? We do not know. I, I wish we. I, I think this is an area for research, right? So you have all these British bases, right, all over Singapore, and then now they are all uh, belong to Singapore. But ask ourselves a simple question: Are there any HDB flats built on any of the British bases? None. Why? Why are they still kept as a kind of, a, you know, in the old black and white houses, you know, and, and some of the old military infrastructure now converted into commercial purposes and so on, but no housing. Why? But I, I have no answer. And so besides Sambawang, the, the RF airbase at Changi became available for civilian use. Okay, so this is how Changi Airport at or this end of the island, right, was shifted from here. Somewhere here was the... <laughs> Paliba Airport, right, which was going to be expected, uh, built more. Uh, the proposal was to build three run, two, two more runways, right, and that would have killed all this whole area, right, because as a, as the aeroplanes fly in, there have to be safety zones and so on. So, uh, it had to be moved to Changi. Okay. So. SPUR, which I was a member of, uh, Singapore Planning and Urban Research Group, we proposed to move the, the Public Works Department's ill-considered proposal for Paliba Airport expansion to move it to Changi. Uh, why did it become, why did it receive such animosity from the bureaucracy? This is a mystery, right? 1971, right? This is the, 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 the flight path, you see. You can see the, 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 the whole of uh, actually downtown Marina Marina Center and all it would have been impossible to live, right? Uh, the Katong uh, Geelang area would be would be solarized, right? The the uh, uh, the Loyang area would be completely unlivable, right? So so this was what we we I, I in fact uh, produced this map and I I, get, I I presented it at a press conference and uh, I took all the the heat from the uh, Ao Yun Chong was the firm stack at the time. He was very angry with me. Yeah. So it was, uh, if, but to the credit, the government eventually took accepted the idea and uh, and moved it to Changi, right? So some questions are that that that, that when when Lee Kuan Yew was in uh, in in Cambridge, um, Go King Sui was in London, right? The the Malayan Forum Group was in London. Right, so Chin Chai, Rajaradam, uh, and, and all the guys that were to be down there. Kuan Yu was in Cambridge. He came down occasionally to, to, uh, to London. And his good friend in Cambridge was uh, Harold Wilson, right? So did Harold Wilson uh, help in the transfer of the bases, right? Because Harold Wilson was kind of left wing, you see, right? So this is a very strange thing. And I think this whole area needs to be 
to be documented and researched. And I'm sure there are documents in the British archives uh, which uh, need to be to be looked at if they have not already been been looked at, right? So you have uh, Mrs. Lee and 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 and, and so on. Uh, well, was Cambridge at that time uh, left leaning? We do not know, right? Uh, I I would like to know, right? So we we. we this is an, an, an unknown area, right? But in London, the London School of Economics was definitely left-leaning because Woking Street was there, right? And it, and it was influenced by uh, uh, a lot of the uh, left-wing uh, leaders, uh, teachers and professors in uh, in London School of Economics, right? Uh, why did the PAP cling to its own socialist self-image even after becoming a global city, right? And this is another issue, see, right? In 1976, uh, why did the PAP then formally resign from the Socialist mm -hmm. International, right, which he belonged to, right, uh, after the Dutch Labour Party proposed to expel the PAP on allegations of indefinite detention of left-leaning uh, political opponents, including Chia Tai Po and so on and so forth, right? So the Dutch uh, Labour Party and, and, uh, and the European... Uh, I mean, was it a kind of a, a, a Western dominance that that also triggered this this kind of uh, attitude right towards Singapore? What, what did, did they regard Singapore as a young upstart, right, who were trying to to uh, uh, show its muscles, right? And um, so they wanted to to expel them. So this was the the result, right? So the PAP then published this book, Socialism That Works. And it's a very, very, very uh, tricky title. See, you know, it's your socialism that doesn't work. <laughs> it's ours that works, right? So this is the the book that answers them, right? And so these are the the people who who wrote chapters in this book, right? For of course the the initial uh, chapter was written by Rajaratnam, right? The communism as a real threat was written by Chua Tianqin, right? Who was actually uh, related uh, by through marriage to Li Kuan Yew, right? Uh, and then the 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 new left of Southeast Asia development was like Lao Tek Soon, who was a, a professor of uh, political science in the N N US, right? Uh, the socialist economy that works was uh, written by Bo Keng Sui, right? Uh, Foreign investment and multinational corporations in the developing countries, written by Augustine Tan. Remember, Augustine was one of the the bright sparks that was picked up by Lee Kuan Yew, right, to bring into the uh, PAP, right, in the in the uh, continuing process of what uh, is regarded by the PAP as a kind of a, a renewal leadership renewal process, right. Uh, but uh, Augustine uh, disappointed uh, Lee Kuan Yew, who then passed a, a caustic remark that. He's a six-cylinder engine running on four. <laughs> trade unions, of course, uh, Devon Ayer was very important in shaping the trade unions uh, in line with uh, the new uh, policies, right? Uh, Lee Chin Kun on, on foreign policy, right? Uh, Yu Yi Shun on the, on the, on the Singapore woman, right? I mean, we were very, very proud of the fact that uh, 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 the equality of women was one of the important uh, 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 cornerstones of PAP ideology from the beginning. Madam Chan Choi Xiong was one of the uh, the so-called uh, uh, Yu Kui woman, right? Was uh, very very prominent, right? Um, and of course, uh, Devon Nair and so on. So this was the the the, the counter attack, right? And then 1972. The Paris Accords. Now, this is where Kennedy comes in. Yeah? At the same time as he was talking peace with the Vietnamese, right, to achieve peace with honor, that means they wanted to withdraw. They knew that they were losing the Vietnam Vietnam War, right. But at the same time, they were talking about about the uh, uh, withdrawal with honor. He was bombing uh, with, with, uh, uh, Hanoi, right. And this is why a few of us were very upset, right. So we organized this uh, 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 demonstration in front of the uh, U.S. Embassy in uh, uh, Hill Street, High Street, uh, and to present our, 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 our petition to the ambassador, right? So you can see these are the, 
the pictures uh, of the of the demonstration. And all of us who were involved in this got into trouble. And so why were Singaporeans arrested and punished for this? You see, this is the the the, the evolving uh, uh, relationship between <clears throat> Singapore and the Anglo-American order, right? That's why I asked the question, are we really independent? So this is the, the clear demonstration of it. Now, <clears throat> so why did Lee Kuan Yew begin then, 1990? It's quite a gap, right? This was 72, just 20 years later. Why did Lee Kuan Yew begin to promote Asian values? Was it opportunism to tap into China's growth, right? right. So this is the, the, the type of situation, right? Um, the, the, the very, Amer uh, uh, very important uh, American writer, um, uh, as Ezra Vogel was invited to Singapore, gave a lot of public lectures, right? And he wrote this very important book, Japan as Number One, right? So this is uh, the, the beginning of the uh, uh, Asian values uh, 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 promotion in, in, in Singapore, right? And of course, Confucius was, uh, was cited quite a lot, right? And you have this uh, famous guy, Tu Wei Ming, who came to Singapore. I actually met him, right? And he was uh, one of the, the great uh, propon proponents of, of, of Confucianism as a basic uh, uh, human value, right? Of course, it's an uh, important Chinese value as well. Okay. So as a result of which, the, uh, uh, Teng Xiaoping visited Singapore uh, to, to, to learn about how uh, uh, offshore accounts in Singapore can be organized, right, and, and, and would not become a, a, a political problem, right? So Deng Xiaoping actually, in the end, actually said that he learned a lot from Singapore. And that's why the, the coastal city uh, developments in, in Shenzhen, in, in, in Xiamen, uh, uh, in, in, in Shanghai and so on, uh, be, began uh, model after the Singapore model, okay? So by, by 1985, Go King Si was appointed by the Chinese government to be an economic advisor, uh, that's after after King Sui had already kind of retired from the Singapore politics. Right? Uh, so this is the, the the beginning, right? So all of this has to do with the the the, the nature of the the present situation in Singapore after the global the the, the, the global in, within the global context, right? Now. So Sucho Industrial Park was started. This is the picture of it. So this was a China Singapore handshake, right? Uh, and then uh, we have to keep neutral because uh, we can't we can't be uh, leaning on one side or the other side. Our national interest uh, requires that we have a balanced approach and so on. Uh, so, so it's something that uh, how to keep the state safe uh, is is very important. But the problem is that by keeping the state super safe, are we making the people down? That's a, that is the the problem of the present order. Okay. And, and in the process of doing so, we have the uh, preservation of public security order, which is the British uh, uh, legal en enactment based on the, uh, the, the PPSO, which was implemented in India during the British colonial time, which later became the, the, the ISA, right? The Internal Security Act, which uh, allowed the government to, to, to arrest people without warrant, without, without reason, right? And to, and to prevent any kind of... Uh, uh, a build up of uh, uh, antagonism and, and and so on, and then you have the CPIB, which is to make sure that uh, uh, corruption is, uh, is 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 strictly uh, 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 anti corruption is strictly enforced, and that's why CPIB is always part of the prime minister's office, right? And then you had the strange thing called the suitability certificate. If you are a, a, a belong to a family that is left wing. Uh, you will not get a suitability certificate in those days, right? In the eighties and nineties, you cannot go to university, you cannot go to polytechnic, because uh, you are not suitable. This is to prevent uh, 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 left wing infiltration into the uh, student unions in the various places. And then you have the press act that makes sure that uh, uh, newspapers are uh, uh, conform to uh, 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 directives from the from the authorities, right? And then now, of course, you have POFMA, right? The prevention of, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, sorry? 
uh, yeah, false, uh, false, false, false media and, and so on. And then you have FICA, right? The prevention of uh, foreign interference uh, into Singapore. So all of these things have, have created a kind of uh, a mood, a kind of uh, 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 effect of uh, 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 making people more cautious, uh, uh, not, not trying to speak out, speak their mind. Everybody kind of uh, self censors themselves, right? Don't take any <coughs> risky, don't don't take risky positions and so on. So we have become very very timid, and this is the strange thing, because I I have friends and I know what's going on. There are a lot of creative people within our uh, within A star within uh, 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 the universities, the research people, the professors, uh, students and so on. There are a lot of new inventions. Singapore has a lot of. Uh, or patents, right? But there are hardly any, but hardly any of these are commercialized. So we have a, a situation in which I, I myself have often come across it, right? Whenever you have some new idea, uh, you put forward to, to, to people in, in authority, they will always respond, has it been done before? If it hasn't been done before, then we cannot do it. See? So this is the kind of cautious, uh, 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 atti attitude, which I think is, has weakened our people. So how do we break out of this? This is the the, the 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 topic which I will be dealing in part three, right? But right now we have to recognize the fact that we have we are living under such an order, right? So this is the the the, the problem, right? So let me go through some of the if it is that operation spectrum, right? Now these are young people who are idealistic, right? Who are Supporting uh, the the poor and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, under underdogs and so on, and uh, they they were uh, uh, they were tarred with a with a with a brush that calls them Marxists, and therefore they had to be to be taken care of. Okay, uh, then you have uh, uh, liberation theology, which was a, a, a Christian theological de uh, development, mainly mainly uh, in Latin America among the Roman Catholics, right? They attempt to address the problems of poverty and social injustice as well as spiritual matters, right? And many of the Catholic, uh, uh, ac the activists who were Catholics themselves, right, were, uh, uh, they, they, they believe in, the, in, 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 in this kind of ideology, right? But uh, out, of, out of the goodness of their own heart. But because the liberation theology was tainted by uh, kind of left wing Marxist uh, 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 influence, right? They had to be to be taken care of, right? And so you have uh, 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 people like this, right? Right? It's a Marxist com conspiracy, so you arrest them, right? Right? So why regulate? Not only political culture, but also popular culture was regulated, right? So, for example, with people with long hair, have to be not allowed. <laughs> you have to cut your hair, right? So, uh, this was the kind of uh, dangerous counterculture that was coming out from America, right? Uh, the the so-called hippie culture, right? Again, the, this is not a, the kind of culture that that uh, the global the global city would en encounter, right? Because we we want to have a uh, uh, speak and span uh, working workforce. We don't want to have all these uh, layabouts, you know, uh, uh, damaging our, our work ethic, right? So they had to be taken care of, right? Okay. So how to discipline education through uh, society through education, right? Streaming. So this is how streaming took place, right? So there are three, three, uh, 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 right? The, the, Normal technical, which are the guys that are not very good in the in 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 uh, in the arts and in, in, in the sciences, right? Then you have the uh, uh the advanced course, and then you have the extreme uh extreme course, and so on. So there are many many different layers, right? So this was this was a the the, the strange thing you see. So although it was promulgated by Goging Sui himself, right? He himself says these things. So he's a very conflicted person, you see, that the preoccupation in Singapore with exam results is unnatural and unhealthy. And we should bring it to an end as early as possible. And yet he's the one who promoted uh, 
this uh, streaming and, and, and moral education and so on in the in the schools. So it's a very conflicted uh, uh, person, okay? right? Um, so why then did Dr. Go introduce streaming in schools? And yet, and here he says this, right? it's, a, it's, a, it's very puzzling, right? Now, how to maintain the work ethic? So this is the book by Theodore Rosat, The Making of a Counterculture in America, right? So this is a, something that the, the, the PAP government is very watchful against, right? So you cannot have all this all these hippies running around, right? You just put an end to it. Yeah. Right. So the, the other thing that needs to be controlled is the press, right? And this is where I think Balji will be able to give us some inside information, right? Control of the press, right? Right. Uh, I, I was involved in 1971, the, the, the Singapore Herald, the founding editor, Francis Wong, who had fought a protracted battle with Lee Kuan Yew over many things, right, was forced to resign. And the uh, and the license, the publishing license of the Singapore Herald was cancelled, right? Right. But the, the, the tabloid newspaper public license was suspended by the Singapore government on the 28th May 1971, right, and so on and so forth, right? And um, I then uh, organized a, a group of people uh, to take it over uh, as, a, as a Singapore, fully owned Singapore cooperative, right? And no matter how much money you put into the, as a, as a shareholder, you only have one vote, right? So everybody has one vote. So it's a fully democratized, uh, locally uh, 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 grounded uh, Singaporean newspaper, right? And uh, negotiated uh, with uh, Mr. Rajaratnam uh, for the printing license. But of course, it was denied because Lee Kuan Yew said that it's a political ploy. So that was the end of it, right? So these are the kind of uh, uh, com commentaries that uh, the, the 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 cartoonists are uh, are true, right? But Singapore, uh, Lee Kuan Yew sitting in a in a tank with a gun aimed at the uh, newspaper, right? Uh, the, and the tank flying the PAP flag. So in answer to question regarding the establishment of a totally Singapore-owned cooperative to take over the newspaper against allegations that the Herald was under foreign influence, Lee's reply was dismissive, saying it's just a political ploy, right? So he says this, freedom of the press, freedom of the news media must be subordinated to the overriding needs of the integrity of the Singapore and the pri primacy of the purpose of an elected government, right? So there's no doubt about it, right? The the, the newspaper cannot be uh, a, 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 an instrument or an organ of free expression. It has to be under total control, right? So this is very clear, right? Uh, so these are some of the cartoons, right? right? This is uh, 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 Lee Kuan Yew showering, <laughs> making fun of him. Okay, then there's the, the, the issue of eugenics, you see, 1984. Right. Uh, yes, we need more babies, but only for graduate mothers, right? So graduate mothers would be given uh, 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 a, a, a lot of money if you produce more children. And those who, who, were, who were not graduates and who will come from uh, the lower working classes, right? if they like it, uh, they will be given a lot of money. You know, they don't want them to, to reproduce, right? So this is a, the kind of social uh, eugenics policy that was going on, right? So the low birth rate among the well-educated would result in the weakening of economy, the suffering of administration, and the decline of society. This is the, 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 the ideology behind, right? So then the question that arises is, why minister's salary must match private sectors? Is this a new liberal value? Right? This is a, I, 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 hear, I hardly hear any discussion about this, right? So how much are, are ministers paid? Right? Well, here you are, right? Prime minister is 2.2 uh, .2 million. Uh, deputy prime minister, 1.87 million. President, 1.6 million. Speaker of parliament, 1.2 million. And so on and so on and so forth. So, the moment you have you pay ministers uh, this kind of salary, then of course uh, senior civil servants, right, uh, 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 and and so on must also uh, be be in line, right. So so the whole pay structure of the of the of the administration 
uh, uh, goes up tremendously. Now, does it does it in it, it does it then cause a kind of uh, excessive caution, uh, exaggerated caution by administrators because they don't want to make any mistakes, so they they play safe, right? Because if they make any mistake, I mean, Lee Kuan Yew is very very intolerant of men of mistakes, right? So you will you might lose your job, so your your all your 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 high pay and so on will be at at risk. So people don't want to take any risk, right? So we must stop the politics, the poisonous politics of envy. This is the thing, right? This is the, was this the beginning of the drift in the PAP's implicit ideology, right? And yet the PAP claimed that they have no ideology. They are pragmatic, right? So this is a speech by S. Rajaratnam, Deputy Prime Minister, Foreign Affairs, at the dinner and celebration of the 60th birthday of Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew on the 16th of September, 1983. Now, I want to read this out to you. Rajaranam says, only such a Singapore can, in a world of roaming hungry predators, be assured of a secure and honourable existence. His, that means uh, Guan Yu's, main concern is to create Singaporeans of quality. Since the number game, numbers game is not for us, it's not in our favour, uh, we don't have a big population, he knows full well that as with great adversity, Prosperity too, if, improp if improperly enjoyed, can transform lions into fattened rabbits. See, therefore, right, we must be very tight-fisted. Don't be too generous with any of your funding, you know. So this is the problem, right? So the people are now saying, you know, we, we have to work hard. Our salaries don't rise very fast, right? In the meantime, uh, PAP leaders and, 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 and senior administrators administrators have a huge uh, pay increase. So this is the, the kind of money theism, right, that, that uh, uh, Rajaratnam uh, was, uh, he spoke up about, right? Money theism is, 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 is the term that he coined, right? The, the worship of money as God, right? Money God, right? Now, the other issue that we need to understand is pra pragmatism, right? And Lee Kuan Yew says this, I was never a prisoner of any theory. That's what he says. But actually, he has a lot of theory. What guided me were reason and reality. The acid test I applied to every theory or scheme was, would it work? The acid test is in performance, not promises. It is not from weakness that one commands respect. As long as the leaders take care of their people, they will obey the leaders. See? So this is the the framing of his, uh, his political methodology. But was the PAP really pragmatic? It does not have explicit ideology, but it's the implicit ones that are more powerful. And what are these? Are these the implicit ideologies that underpin the PAP's pragmatics? Number one, it says, the best and brightest scholars must lead and be well rewarded. So this is an ideology, right? Although you see it's pragmatic. Number two, power must be strong and it must be feared, right? You cannot be strong without uh, inducing people to be afraid of it, right? Number three, media must be under state control, cannot be free media. Uh, number four, human equality is a false idea. Elitism is the reality. People are different, right? They are born smart or born dumb. <laughs> and only the smart are rich, number five. Number six, education must serve the economy and conform to ensure stability, right? So there's no such thing as uh, 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 you can jump from one thing to another. You go through the step by step. But, and money is the best form of reward. When you have good uh, money reward, then you, have the, you, you inspire performance. Foreign talent from the West is better than your local talent. Right. Local talent may be playing a fool, may be trying to bluff you. So you must be careful. Right? And racism must not be allowed. Right? So we must have uh, uh, equality of, 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 of the races, right? Right? which I think is a good thing. The government must monopolize all ideas and never be challenged. So this is the point, you see. So when you ask for ideas from the public, Right, only only uh, uh, weak weak and uh, uh, decorative ideas 
will, will be allowed, right? What the deep questions that challenge the orthodoxy will not be allowed. Uh, and, and, and that is why, was that why former Indonesian President Habibi uh, was peeved because uh, he could not get uh, the oil, oil processing center to be in Batam, which he wanted, right? And he was eventually, uh, 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 Philip Yeo actually managed to, to get, get it all into uh, the cluster of islands uh, in, 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 in uh, just south of uh, Jurong, right? It's now called uh, Jurong Island, right? So we we got uh, we 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 persuaded all the oil companies to set up the oil processing center there. So uh, Habibi was very very upset. So he called he he used the term to describe him, you little red dot, right? Meaning to 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 to, to make us look small, right? But but on the contrary, Singaporeans take it as a badge of honor. <laughs> This is amazing, right? But the question is that there we imagine a bigger future beyond this little red dot. This is the problem now, see? And they will deal with this in part three. The little red dot, right, has become the emblem of our mindset, right? We think small, we dare not think big, right? And we think short term, we dare not think long term, right? So is Lee Kuan Yew's survival strategy now being overtaken by the uh, bricks, right? The, the uh, uh, what is it? Bricks. Uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, Brazil, Russia India. India, China, South, South Africa. Africa, and then now they have added added a lot of the Arab countries, including Argentina. So this is the right. Is it the? Is it the? Is, does it threaten the new global the, the existing global order? I think this is something that is, that is left to be seen. Right. Okay. So we have the. Uh, the conditions are, are maturing for the final defeat of the neoliberal order. Right? So this is what's happening now. And this is the underpinning uh, uh, conflict between uh, United States and China, the West versus China, right? So uh, because they, they fear that China is uh, 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 growing too big, too, too powerful, right? Okay. So this, this is the BRICS uh, 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 map. map. So then we have the emergence of a whole new force, the World Economic Forum, the, uh, who are who are shouting for the Great Reset, right? And they they are, they are the they consist of the, all the rich people, right? And I don't know why Talman is a member of this this, this uh, uh, organization, right? Uh, maybe he's there to spy on it, uh, and I think that that's a good idea to to learn what they are really thinking, right? But uh, I I don't know how how convinced he is that. Uh, of the Great Reset, right? Then the Great Reset means they want to infiltrate into all the international organizations, right? Their own people with their own ideas, right? So, for example, the 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 the, the medical uh, thing is, is is now being 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 a very major issue, right? Okay, so this is the twenty twenty three WEF opening. So, summarize. First Yalta 45, now WEF 2023. Must we let the oligarchs run our world? Can Singapore and ASEAN be really sovereign under the overarching Western imperialism? So this is the end of part two. So how now? How can a prune human nature imagine a bold new future? This is the big question now, you see. So... Please see part three when we come to it uh, in early uh, January, right? It will, it will discuss ideas about the future and how to strengthen the system and the people. It has to be both, you see. We have to strengthen the system, which means we need to change some of the, the system uh, 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 problems and to have to overcome the, 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 the people's uh, uh, fear of... Uh, of uh, big ideas and fear of uh, uh, untried uh, 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 ideas and, and, uh, and options. So this is the future. So thank you very much. And I'd like to invite all the our, our commentators to chime in. Thank you. OK, um, I'm sure everybody uh, joined me in thanking uh, Prof Te for this uh, very enlightening talk. And also, uh, happy birthday to Prof Te. Today's oh, birthday. You, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, so we have three distinguished uh, commentators of today's talk. Uh, first of all, Ms. Brima Marti, who was the uh, who was an NMP from 2001 to 2004. Uh, she's a social activist and uh, spent some time in Malaysia. So we'd be very uh, interested to get her views on uh, tonight's talk. Uh, next, we have Mr. P. N. Baoji, who has a very long and distinguished uh, career in media. Uh, later, I will spend some time going through his accomplishments. Uh, but uh, for now, I'll jump straight ahead to Mr. Tanti Singh, who was a detainee uh, under Operation Spectrum. Um, he's also an active uh, social activist. Uh, of the three of them, I think we asked uh, Brima to go first to give your views on the tonight's talk. So, Brima, over to you. Okay. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for making time to attend this, and I hope I can be useful. And thank you, Prof. Tay, was illuminating your whole mapping of quite a number of different parts on which I have feverishly taken down some main points. And to respond to some of your questions and what um what you have put forward, right? I, I'm struggling with a concept here of whether Singapore is transiting or are we transforming where we are, comparing what you have tracked from the past to where we are and where I also have to touch where we think Singapore is heading towards. Sometimes that direction is not so clear. So if if I were to say that we are transforming, then I would say that like what you have also pointed out, that would be clearer uh, a clearer focus on our ideology as well as a greater level of inclusivity and a greater level of engagement. To this, the state would respond immediately to say that they have this apparatus called Forward Singapore, which anyone of us can give views, etc. So from their perspective, there's engagement. But I still wonder whether we are putting around a lot of different tools or are we from internally moving towards greater transformation from within? I will just leave it hanging there because I think as we discuss, more stuff will come up. The second one about leadership of uh, our former and founding prime minister, actually no, uh, our former prime minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, right? So when we have... It, it's my view, it's a personal view, that if you have an overbearing uh, uh, person who speaks super eloquently, who is very good in, in his oral communication as well as written communication, is a states person within parliament as well as in the diplomatic diplomatic field, it is very easy in a developing stage to influence and make a lot of uh, your people, meaning us as Singaporeans, get into a mindset of thinking in the same way. And I think that can become a break, a, a very tight hole that we are still struggling to get out of. And how was this tight hole further um, I'm trying not to use the word noose, but further pushed harder onto us was because there were a number of restrictions, legal restrictions that do not give us really the space sometimes without permits and and the fear of be of have of being defaced, of facing defamation, etc., that makes us step back a lot. Secondly, the other one, the other restriction is ensuring that the People's Action Party retains its powerhouse within the elections uh, uh, by having the GRC, by whereby one vote can bring in at least about anything from four and even at one time, seven members. And you put a lot of pressure uh, on the opposition parties who will then be struggling to find that kind of candidature suitable 
for elections. Likewise, Dito, we see the same struggle happening with the uh, ruling party of uh, uh, ability. So it comes in many forms, the levels in which a tight hole was increased over a number of years. The third point that I would like to raise is what you mentioned as the global city. I seem to take see it a little bit differently from whether we are this is our pandering to Western imperialism, etc. I see it more as us trying back to our pragmatism that you talked quite a lot about. Uh, are other solutions not being seen that we have to really reach out BRICS, whether it's BRICS, whether it is really being super friendly with the US to maintain our relations and really maintaining it also with China, India. Is this the schema both for our economics as well as for survival is the big thing that I think we really need to diagnose because we are struggling with Singapore being a city a city and a state, a nation as well as a city. How do we get around this if we do not get into a more global arena, which has been accelerated a lot by digitization? So how are we going to step back, I think, is the bigger issue when we have urbanized so much. And thank you for letting me know that a lot of our buildings are done by American architects. Uh, uh, quite is interesting and these are all the information that we need to to get and the other one that um that we have built up our heritage for tourism perhaps but we have also built it up because unesco and un is really uh, pushing out on its own that countries must claim back their histories. So right now we are trying to promote our Sarong Kabaya as another one under UNESCO. And it is for me diplomatically, is that part of our, uh, our way to becoming more global or regional? Is the Sarong Kabaya ours? Does it belong to Malaysia? Does it belong to Indonesia? We will have the Laksa story coming through again if we do. So, so I'm saying that we try to be global, we try to be local, and within that whole area, we are still not clearly defined. Purpose, motivation, I would say that we need to know, I would like to read up more, what is the impetus that we are running this way? Is there no other recourse because we have no other hinterland? So is the digital world and the global world our hinterland to keep our trade? Because that is how we have been surviving and I, and I think that is how I'm seeing your disc. Uh, that's my response to your discussion. The last point I'll make, I have a few more, but the last point I would make is that we, 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 we may, may perhaps have overlooked an important part of what uh, has come into play globally, which is the sustainable development goals. I, as you were talking, I, I, I quickly pull back Singapore's uh, annually. Uh, you got to submit your SDG report uh, to the UN. It's so uh, filled with facts and figures that I have to ask a lot of other questions to deconstruct it. And yet, number one is no poverty. And we have, if I'm not mistaken, either number three, health issues. It covers, it's an intersectional uh, a matrix that it covers every aspect of a human being and every aspect of a society and a community. In Singapore, we are very quiet on the SDG. Developing countries keep going on about the SDG. So is this our lack that we as a population are not receiving enough information when we have um, easy, easy uh, tools to get information being highly digitized. Why is this, I feel, still not so clearly put onto the main platform, although sustainability is, right? And there's 17 sustainable development goals. Are we then no longer developing when we have high income inequalities, etc.? So there's a lot more to unpack on the last point that I have raised, but I will hold off first uh, until further um, whatever. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Bhima. 
uh, you've given us a lot to digest, uh, but we will come back to points that you raised. Uh, I'd like to move on to Mr. P.N. Balji. As I mentioned, he has a very long and uh, distinguished career. He started in 1970 the Malay Mail as a reporter. And then uh, from 1980 to 1982, he was editor at the New Nation. And after New Nation, he moved on to Straight Times, uh, 1982 to 1988, and then to the New Paper, 1988 to 1990. Uh, and the longest period was actually in Today, from 1990 to 2000. Uh, Bauji, please correct me if I'm wrong. Huh? Uh, after Today, he became the CEO of Media Corp Press, 2000 to 2004. And then uh, he left media and uh, rather mainstream media and set up Bang Public Relations. Uh, after that, he went back to academia as adjunct professor in NTO School of Commerce and Journalism from 2006 to 2010. Uh, after that, uh, uh, between the years of 2006 to 2010, he was also a director in the Asian Journalism Fellowship at the NTO Wikimui School of Commerce. Wow. <laughs> so I actually stopped there because, you know, there's so much more that you did after uh, Academia. Um, so my, my, my view on uh, Baoji, maybe you want to give your comments first on uh, King Sun's talk. Over to you, Baoji. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I must say that uh, I was uh, blown you know, listening to uh, King Sun. And uh, the, I noted some of the points, and 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 King Sun had given a, 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 what to me. Even though I've been in the news business for a long time, uh, I'm not as old as King Sun, maybe slightly younger, but the way he has sketched it, you know, gave me a lot of uh, uh, points to ponder. So I think that's that's my uh, my impression of uh, what Ting Soon said, and also I don't want to go into a big uh, a thorough response to Ting Soon because that will take a lot of time, and we are already reaching nine o'clock. So I will just concentrate because what when Ting Soon spoke to me, he told that we to concentrate on Singapore. Today, that means the present Singapore, and 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 uh, uh, I am in a kind of a happy position because uh, I'm retired. Retired has retirement has given me time to meet Singaporeans, uh, both retired people, young people, not so young people, men, women, children. I think that. I mean, anybody coming to Singapore from outside will look at Singapore as a haven because they don't have a deep understanding of Singapore society. The kind of imp the kind of views that uh, King Soon gave. The, the the impression is that a lot of our people are settled in their lives. The younger people, the retired people, are quite healthy and have a roof over their head. Yet, yet I sense angst in their voices when we talk about the future. Although this is the present, but the present is looking into the future. And there are three points, you know, that I think uh, that I have managed to put together, and and these points I have uh, uh, I have had a number of discussions with a lot of my friends. First point is leadership. I think it has been touched a bit by uh, King Soon. This is the third leadership change that we are seeing, you know, for G, fourth generation, but the third leadership change that we are seeing. And I'm uh, uh, in a fortunate position because I have seen uh, as a journalist, Lee Kuan Yew as Prime Minister, Go Chok Tong as Prime Minister, and Lee Sen Lung as Prime Minister. I have a little uh, interactions with uh, Mr. Lawrence Wong, who is most likely to be the next PM, the fourth PM. The one point I want to make is from Lee Kuan Yew to Go Chok Tong to Lee Sen Lung, I can see a dip 
in the quality of the leadership. Right? Not a, not a great dip, but it, it is a dip. And I think the biggest factor in in the in in uh, the problem of leadership in Singapore is that Lee Kuan Yew had until his death over in the background. You know, when you have such a powerful man sitting in cabinet, watching you, maybe even pulling the strings, it is very difficult to operate, you know. And I think the, the man who suffered the most was uh, Go Chok Tong. Because, I mean, we know all the things that uh, Go uh, uh, Lee, Lee, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Go Chok Tong told a journalist privately, not me, another journalist privately, that I got two uh, dragons, you know, sitting. One on one side is Lee Kuan Yew, and the other side is Lee Sien Lu. But despite that, he still did a commendable job. And what I liked about uh, Go Chok Tong, I'm, I'm uh, digressing a bit here, is despite being uh, between these two dragons, he came across and he said, I want a uh, a society, I want to build a society that is uh, courteous. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's a word he used, you know. And that's not what Lee Kuan Yew wanted anyway, you know, from, from day one. And I think he achieved that to a great extent. Now I come to the, 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 the new leadership. The new leadership is quite different. No Lee Kuan Yew around. Maybe his ghost is there. It is, uh, for me, it is, I mean, of course, it's early days to make uh, uh, a judgment on Lee, uh, Lawrence Wong's performance or would-be performance as PM. Still, I will say one thing, and I think this thing is the most critical thing for the new prime minister, and that is his performance how we judge, or people like me will judge his performance is on whether he will be his own man. What do I mean by it? I mean, I, 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 I mean that will he be daring enough to, to throw out the window if he sees that a certain policy that was under Lee Kuan Yew, that was introduced by Lee Kuan Yew, or Go Chok Tong, or Lee Sen Lung, throw them out the window because he thinks that this is not going to work in the future. It's a big question, Mark. Uh, I'm not sure. And it's very difficult for Lawrence Wong to do that because he has been tutored, you know. He has grown up in this bubble, if I can call it, of all the arguments that can be put up why a certain policy should not be thrown out. That's one. And I think the other thing is, although it is now clearer that Lawrence Wong is the next, is likely to be the next PM, I don't think it is so straightforward. In, uh, in fact, an article in uh, Academia SG some time ago said that Lawrence Wong is a compromise candidate, basically saying that people like uh, Ong Yi Kang, who uh, many, many, many of my friends think that he should be the next PM, but he can't, he won't make the cut because he's in, in all the things that, in most of the things that he has done, uh, in education ministry, now in uh, the health ministry, he's showing to be his own man. I, I won't elaborate on all the things that he has done. And of course, so, and then there is also the talk that Tan Chun Singh is waiting in the wings. So with that kind of, uh, firstly being in the bubble, and then being with these two people, you know, 
breathing down his neck and will he do anything that is different and why do i say it has to be something different because the world has changed so much or changing so much you know that we cannot afford singapore cannot afford to go the same way which can be anything you know whether you uh, uh, take the media as an example can you can you let can you let the media i mean or can should the media be like what it was all the while right and because the government has been such a uh influence on media it it has lost the the sph has lost its uh, the straight sense has lost its power to to for want of a better word to influence the public and today the straight times or the sph or singapore media trust is out with a begging bowl the money is coming from taxpayers this was not what it was when i was in sph SPH was a cash cow. Straits Times was a cash cow. Yeah? So, the, and what is it that keeps the government wanting to control the press? I, I don't have an idea because as the circulation of the Straits Times goes down, and it is going down, you have a situation where the government's uh, uh, messages are not being read. People are more and more reading social media. You know? I still read the Straits Times. It maybe it's a bad habit, but I spend much less time on the Straits Times than on other uh, information that I can get on social media. So the the bottom line is, I am as a as a Singaporean, as a Singaporean who has seen uh, leadership in the likes of uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Go Chok Tong. And uh, Lee Hsien Loong, and and uh, looking at Lawrence Wong, and how he has come to power, I'm not convinced that we will see some kind of a major change. Second uh, point. Sorry, Bauchi. Yeah, good. Uh, because I was uh, going to interrupt you and say spend sure. more time on economy and the social aspect because you mentioned these two other aspects that you want to cover. <laughs> sorry to you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, economy, I think I, I spoke to an economist two days ago, and he was more or less inclined with my view, which is that we will do slightly better next year. Electronics is doing okay. Uh, but the issues that will continue to be devil us is high living and business costs. I don't think that there will be a solution to this or the government will come up with a solution to this. But the big question in economy is what is the economic winner? Where is that winner in to, to push us to the next stage in our economic development? I don't see any. We seem to be doing the same old things, but doing it in a different way. So I don't see, I, I'm I'm actually very, uh, what shall I say, uh, pessimistic you know, about the economy doing better and better. Not, I don't think we will return to the days of the 1900s or early 2000. Now I'll come to the social part. I think it is this uh, this it is this area where I think Singapore faces real problems. The issues are a plenty, many of them. I'll I'll just list out five. I think one, old age. Not because I'm old, but old age is a real problem. I see this in my estate. I see the physical space for older people. Uh, you know, as 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 you get older, you 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 walk. When you walk, you walk slowly, and you find that you you just look at our 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 five foot ways. You know, when two people are walking side by side, there's no space for you. You know, so so and and you also feel very very pushed. 
from the back, you know, although maybe it's an imaginary push. So I think the old age, apart from the living in, in, in older people living in Singapore, but I think the burden on the state will be very, very heavy, right? We have built so many new hospitals in recent times. And still, I read a report a couple of days ago, we are short of hospital beds. Where does this end? Is it? Second one, foreigners who are coming here is an old story. But I think the, 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 the new angle here is the, the type of foreigners who are coming here. I'm not against foreigners. I think they are really helping us. But the problem is trying to move the local talent to the jobs that these foreigners are getting. It is, it is called, it is called uh, uh, now the government wants high, really high tech people. And, and even they have come out with a visa for high tech foreigners. You know? The locals cannot fill that lap. They cannot fill that gap. Maybe some of them will do, but they cannot fill that gap. And the economy and the and and what the the new economy demands, I think the local talent cannot provide because they are not educated and goes to education. They are not educated to provide this kind of skill. Third, high cost living living. Uh, uh, high cost of living, you know, it's it's getting it's getting bad by the day, and if you next year, early next year, we are going to have an increase in GST. Prices are going to go up again. All this kind of thing is, and then there is the the division in society between the elites and the normal people. That will become. A uh, 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 big issue as, as we move forward. The final point is what I call we are now seeing the 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 uh, it's a testy population. The population, the people I speak to, the people I read about, I get the sense that they are all very, you know, angsty. They have got. So many complaints, you know, they, some of them are finding it very difficult to make ends meet. And all these things, the five points I mentioned about social, about society in Singapore, are going to make an impact, a big impact, you know. And when I, I just, I just remembered that in my conversations with older Singaporeans, the one thing I always ask them, are your children in Singapore? Invariably, most of them, at least one is outside Singapore and they are unlikely to come back. It has got many other implications on that, but I think the bigger implication is the older parents who are going to take care of them. Of course, one of them is here. Like in my case, I have one daughter who is in uh, Toronto. She will never come back. You know? She went there 15 years ago to study. She liked the place. She, she continued to to stay on there. She will never come back. I'm sure of that. You know. So these are all the issues that are you know are there may not have been articulated this way. So I would think that the the final question I would pose is what is the future of Singapore? Although we are talking about present. From the present, what is the future of Singapore? Uh, I have no real answer to it, but some of the points that I've mentioned, unless, unless the key here is leadership, unless the leadership is prepared to do certain drastic things and not follow the same uh, playbook, I think we are in for a hard time. Sorry to be so pessimistic, but that's my uh, final point. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Balji. Uh, yeah, so I just want to sum up uh, the points that you mentioned. So the first one is on leadership uh, between uh, 
uh, the, the three different generations of prime ministers. Second one is on the economy. Uh, we're going to face a tough time uh, next year, and probably even up to 2025. Uh, social, you have five points, uh, old age, foreign talent, uh, cost of living or the high cost of living, class divide, and un unhappiness of the uh, populace. Um, I just want to make a small short comment about the leadership. I recall that when uh, Li Senlong went to China, I think in June, July, uh, he brought a large entourage. But the strange thing is he did not bring Lawrence with him to China. So I found it very puzzling, you know. Uh, if he already, at that time, was he just announced that Lawrence would take over from him. Why didn't he bring Lawrence with him to introduce to the Chinese officials? I mean, he's there on the invitation of uh, Xi Jinping. So I thought that would be the great opportunity for him to introduce his uh, uh, number two man, right? Or, but I don't know, what, 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 what do you guys think about that incident? Uh, uh, I, I really don't know. I, I have to ask you a question. Who else did he take with him? I think he took Teo Chi Hien, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and of course, Ho Chin, Ho Chin also went with him. Yeah, but did he take any of the three G leaders or four no. G leaders? No, no, he didn't bring Chan Chun Seng, he didn't bring Ong Yi Kong and all that. Mm -hmm. Then I would be, a, you know, I would be uh, quite concerned. That's one. Second one is that Lawrence Wong is now in China. He's leading a team, his own team, right? And uh, and and uh, two of his uh, deputies are also there. And I mean deputy the uh, Chan Chun Singh and uh, Ong Yi Kang. Both of them are there with him, you know. So I think I, I'm not sure how much of emphasis no, I, to. I think it's probably just a timing thing. Uh, Sorry, I think Brima. It's just a timing thing when uh, this uh, Lee Sen Long went over. You know, he already had planned who would bring along. And now that you mentioned Lawrence is there, then I'm not so concerned. Uh, but yeah. I think Brima raised her hand, so she wants to uh, comment on your your stuff. Brima always got questions. Mute myself. I think maybe we should listen to T Singh first, and then I will come. Oh, you want me to respond now, T Singh? Uh, sorry, T Singh. Really, really sorry. It's already nine fifteen. <laughs> I, 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 not that I want to cut you out, but I really don't want to go too much over time because we are supposed to do it in two hours. But maybe Brima, you go ahead first. Okay, so, uh, okay, I just wanted to raise this point about uh, who are we? Yeah? Uh, in uh, to also to add on to what uh, Balji had raised, but more importantly, to also go back to what King Soon had brought up because, like, who are we present? Who are we? I think at one of the forums that I was on the panel, one of the persons from India uh, asked that he, according to his uh, data, that there are 40% of foreigners in Singapore. This is including the migrant workers and all everyone else. So I did a quick check on my mobile, and I think it is also true that it has increased. So the point... To, and yesterday, I saw a delivery person in my area. The delivery person is a foreigner. Whether the foreigner is on a social visit pass, on a work permit, on an expatriate pass, on a spousal short-term visa or long-term visa, I do not know. And what had happened for me to take note of that, the day before, a Singaporean had asked for help at some place that I was. And there was, I felt still a little bit of judgment. Like, why isn't the 30-year-old son working if he has a diploma? Could, could Can't he be a delivery person? And the next day, I see this scenario mapping. So who are we? If we're going to look up to our leaders... While Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was overbearing, the governance, whether we liked it or we didn't like it, we found it to be overbearingly looking into our lives for the better and for the worse. Today, where is the governance? Where is that tightening of how 
the supply chain of labor, the supply chain of uh, even products, acquisition, everything, where are we? And I feel that here is where I find we are in murky land. It is not clear. And whether this is due to us becoming too many people holding power and leadership positions. I'm not talking just about political leadership. I'm talking about civil service and outsourcing a lot of those jobs to the private sector. And therefore, where are your layers of governance, which is very crucial because it is now, uh, how are the Singaporeans impacted? What is the en enmity and the animosity that some Singaporeans feel? We are actually walking on a very on a tight rope if we are going to talk about multiculturalism and multi-religious and multi-racial issues. We I don't think we are spending enough time talking about all these issues that can really combust very easily and we will be torn apart. That was the point I was making. The second thing to 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 try and mitigate on this, we are going to have an anti-discrimination act, right? I still ask, why is it going to be parked under TAFET? It should apply to any aspect of our life, not only at the workplace, which lastly, I'm tying up to what you have been asking me to talk about my limited but experiential experience in Malaysia. Over there, it's a very clear Bumiputra policy. And therefore, from there, uh, scholarships, uh, career path, uh, everything gets affected. And you can't knock down or erase the Bumiputra policy. In Singapore, we have a 76% Chinese majoritarian uh, community. We need to become sensitive beyond the Anti-Discrimination Act on how we are negotiating our spaces for Singaporeans alone. If we do not look at this, it will combust. Looking at the array of ministers that we have, I rest my case, yeah. I can't pinpoint even one person who's going to take this up as their bastion. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, okay, I think this is a good time to uh, mention something that Bauji uh, said in his book. I'm referring to Mary Lee, who was uh, with the Singapore Herald. I think probably Kang Soon know, know her also. So, uh, you know, she left under the cloud because the government uh, at that time uh, said that the Singapore Herald was a black ox plot mounted by foreigners and uh, the newspaper Singapore Herald had its publishing license suspended. Um, interestingly enough, Mary was asked to come back to media and uh, she came back in, I think, 1975, uh, but she got herself in the hot soup again because in a BBC interview, she meant, she said, it's okay to pay basketball star Michael Jordan millions because his skills were self-evident. But ministers, their skills, if they had any, can't be seen. So, <laughs> of course, uh, at the time LKY was uh, uh, prime minister, he was furious about that. Uh, he, he said that, you know, we cannot have people to criticize uh, the minister's salary. And even until today, uh, the ministerial... Uh, salary is still a very, uh, uh, should we say, uh, golden cow that yeah cannot be slaughtered. So yeah, I just want to raise that point. Maybe uh, Baoji, you remember the Mary Lee incident? Yeah, I remember it very well. Uh, but just a couple of points. Uh, one is that she was, she was one of the best journalists I've ever seen. A very good writer, but of course she's not your not your typical who will support the government all the time. She has a point of view. She will articulate that point of view. When when she was in Herald, Singapore Herald, when Singapore Herald closed, she was very fed up and she left to join some newspapers in uh, Fleet Street in London. And, and from there, she went to, uh, uh, to work in the Far Eastern Economic Review in Hong Kong. 
and she requested she wanted to come back to Singapore with her daughter. So she came back, and then she uh, joined a new paper. And I want to make one clarification about her interview in BBC. Yes, that's exactly what she said in BBC. But the problem was that there is an in-house rule in SPH that when you are invited to uh, uh, any, any publication, it doesn't matter whether it is BBC or CNN, you have to get the editor's permission, which she didn't, which she didn't get. So that was a, a technical error, if I can call it that. Of course, the government was hopping mad about what she said, you know, comparing uh, Michael Jordan's salary and minister's salary and basically saying the ministers don't deserve it, right? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what else I can add to that. Yeah, uh, just now Brima was talking about the uh, changes that we needed uh, in our uh, infrastructure in order to bring about um, great change in Singapore. Um, actually, I have a question here that I prepared for Mr. Arun Bala, but he didn't turn up tonight. So I might put it out to the panel. Uh, I wrote in part one of this uh, series, meaning the three-part series with uh, uh, Is Singapore Really Independent? Arun Bala mentioned that Go King Sui's economic policies work very well for Singapore for the first 30, 40, or even 50 years. But the flip side is that we are trained, and King Soon has mentioned that, we are trained into a mindset of being dependent on foreign talent for upgrading our own skill sets. Now, my question is, if we want to change this mindset of being dependent on foreign talent and opening up space to develop an entrepreneurial mindset uh, to train creative innovators, venture capitalists to find their own capital, uh, this would be very difficult. But do you guys have any ideas how we can go about bringing about change in people's mindset or at the very least the, um, the private sector how can we change that kind of dependence actually uh, uh, sorry uh, Alfred that's exactly the question that I'm addressing in part 3 <laughs> okay so we will yeah yeah, yeah go ahead Brima uh, you are muted muted You have to unmute yourself. Ah, uh, okay. No, I've been trying, but he keeps saying the host has to unmute. Sorry, coming coming to what you raised, right? There are two parts to it, and I think this has been discussed in Parliament rather strongly. Minimum wage or progressive wage. If you want Singaporeans to work as construction workers, I'm sure they can, but you cannot be paying them $18 to $24. $2 per day. It has to go up to a higher level for them to raise their family, for them to pay for the flat, for them to pay for the medical and get pay for the premium for the medical uh, needs that they have. It's a basic need issue and the basic need has gone up and you cannot be. So who as a Singaporean wants to be a construction worker? I mean, I've heard this so often. Singaporeans do not want to do the job. We also have to think about why doesn't a Singaporean want to do the job? But on the other spectrum, going back to what also Balji has raised, our older persons are cl cleaners, working as cleaners, and the salary has gone up to 1002 What is the cash in hand? I do not know. There's a whole study that needs to be done. On the other on just another level of pe folks getting a little bit upset that there are so many persons from South Asia working in the IT industry. If you look at the hi the history and you look at the, the level of creativity and democracy in India, you find that innovation and survival survival is a big thing it's so competitive you got to get on with it and and get your your knots and your dots all in place right so with that kind of history you find that people run after whenever they see an opportunity and if they have gotten a lot of experience in many other parts of the world and apply for the job, they will get the job. But the other question, as also raised by Balji, not question, area of concern is, despite all the um, the causes and the SS, the one in Thailand, but so many causes there, why is our pickup not fast enough? 
And that, I think, we really got to look at impact outcome questions. And in Parliament, this has to be fine-tuned to ask, where are they now? They've done the course. Have they moved the, uh, to another field? Are they still in the same field with an extra job uh, description added into their portfolio? I think we are living in, with a lot of areas where we do not have information. And uh, that is what I would say to what you have raised. But if you do not mind, I want to go back to what uh, Prof. King Soon has raised about historical documentation. That was part of the story of what New Narrative and Dr. Tam Ping Jin raised. Uh, and, and he said that the Q archives have opened up uh, a lot of documents after 30 years. So where is where are we going to get the grant money so that other historians and anthropologists can go and look at all these documents? Because I too think it is very important for our future generations to know what is the history between uh, Dr. Go Kingsley and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And we have to look at the documents and some of the archival material that was found at number 38 Oxley Road. Where are they now? And don't they have to be given at a national archival, uh, into a national archival purpose? It has to be deemed that it has to be national archival purpose. So we have many areas, even though you are doing all this wonderful job of sharing so much, the gaps are remain quite huge. And how are we going to bridge the gaps? Um, I don't know. And that, that goes back also to uh, uh, Balji's point about leadership, right? Because as I was just looking at this, I went to look up certain points. Do you know that our cabinet size has been increasing over the years? Yeah. And, and we have been having under uh, former Prime Minister Go Chok Tong, more uh, the numbers of military personnel coming into politics has gone up over the years, except for the last one, which was three out of 21 members in cabinet. But 21 members in cabinet is the highest number we had when at, at one time we had only 16. So are the portfolios of looking after Singapore so demanding that we have to have so many cabinet persons because it's all ministerial salaries. There are many questions and therefore uh, I hope in the, in the next part three discussion we will talk about where the citizenry has the power and okay. I still find high resistance to using the vote. Yeah. Okay, uh, one of your things that you mentioned was uh, talking about PJ Tam. You know, uh, Friday conversation agree that uh, DJ will be a great source uh, for uh, investigating the history of uh, Singapore. Maybe uh, King Sun, you want to talk about you know is PJ likely to come on board with uh, one to talk uh, to FC? Well, I, I would like to to have him on on our Zoom sessions. Uh, I in fact I asked him, but he said that uh, he was not available because he was going to to. Uh, Japan on a holiday, <laughs> but the latest news is that uh, his wife, uh, who is an oh. academic in Manila, uh, was disinvited to a conference in NUS, obviously uh, because of her association with him. So I mean that 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 says a lot about academic freedom, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this is part of the I I call the weakening process, you know, of of of, of the Singaporean because unless we are able to, to debate uh, robustly with very different points of view. How are we going to develop the, the intellectual strength? You know, This is the problem, you see. We have been uh, handled too much. Uh, uh, kid gloves, right? Kid gloves, you know? So we are, in, in a sense, um, uh, rather uh, becoming a lot of uh, strawberry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I think I want to give some time to teasing. I feel very bad because okay. you know you didn't get a chance to uh you know uh, say something. I think you mentioned about the Freedom of Information Act in a recent forum organized by Friday Conversations, right? So teasing, you want to give your view about uh information? You are muted. Well, let me. I, who said? I, I mute myself. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we can hear you now. Actually, I have nothing 
learned to add in this conversation. Uh, but I my commentary will be from as a as a person who experienced all the disciplining that uh King Soon talked about. So uh see, I was born in 1958, the year before the uh we had we achieved self-governance, which is the start of what we call the Medica project. I went to school in 1965. Every day we are told about the mission, new mission statement of our uh, new nation. Uh, every day we will, we, will, we will have to pledge. So yes, now that earlier question, there are some questions about what is the future. I think at this point of time, my sense of it is that I think the medical project has not really be completed. <laughs> to build a democratic society based on justice and, and equality, uh, I think we may have to go and visit that, that basic mission statement before we talk about any other thing and so on. Because you keep throwing out new things about, uh, I mean, of course, the government will, will, will have new policies and, and, and justification for their policies and so on. But what is the basic tenet of our, our, our nation? If we talk about future, then the question will be, what is the future we want? I, and I say at this point of time, haven't seen a new vision from anybody yet. I will still stay with the old vision of to build a democratic society based on justice and equality. Okay? Okay, I want to respond to that directly because this is a key issue in my part three, right? So I'm going to give you a very quick rundown mm. on it, right? The, the proposal that I'm making is to turn the five CDCs into five governments. Yeah. So that each, each uh, of the CDC will be uh, a, an independent government, rather like the Swiss system, no? the Canton system. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the, the mayor and the, and the administrators of that, con of that uh, uh, community development council will, be, will have to be elected. Yeah. And therefore, each of these councils will have about, five, about a million people. And then you can have a direct democracy and let them all compete with each other who can produce a better environment. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the beginning of the un, uh, un, unshackling of the Singapore mind. Unless you change the political order, you cannot change the mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this will be part three. And, and this is what I wrote, if you all do not mind, in my NMP chapter in the book, that we mm -hmm. need to separate the mayor's role and even the mm -hmm. town council and yeah. maybe even yes. have a smaller parliament so we may have different types of elections but this yeah. means a lot of citizens have to be educated because we yeah. have one system for so long yeah, yeah. so un unless you are, are able to have this kind of a new uh, political system right people will not be educated because they are they are they are enmeshed within the existing order Mm -hmm. So this is the fundamental shift that the, must take place. And mm -hmm. this is the challenge I want to throw at the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the fourth generation leaders, right? right? You have to be bold enough mm -hmm. to really change the political system. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will not change the people. And if you don't change the people, we have no future. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Anybody want to comment on what this, uh, King Sun said? No, 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 no need to comment because this, we will have a, a lot of time to discuss this in, in, in part three, which will have to be in, uh, uh, I think, early January, right? Yeah. Yeah, tentatively, it's uh, 5th of January. Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, it's a very quiet audience tonight. I keep yeah. asking for I, 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 I was also uh, thinking about this, you know, because I think, I think Singaporeans are, are fed up and sick of the Singapore present situation. So, so the, why, 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 why bother to be interested? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, but I, I would expect that uh, in the uh, third, third session, we will have a lot more of uh, this. And I think we need to go to three hours. It cannot be two hours. Okay. Uh, no problem. La. I mean, the, the Zoom license doesn't really have a time limit. Yeah. So we, we can go to... It is, it's only a matter of whether the audience... Uh, oh, I think Mr. Yap uh, would like to ask uh, the panel something. Let me unmute him. Uh. Hold on, where is Yap? Okay, uh, is it Marcus? Yes, it's Marcus. I'd just like to ask Mr. Taking soon. 
Um, he Professor met, Tay. Sorry, Professor Tay King Soon. Uh, my apologies. Um, he said that he was against Western imperialism and he wants a countervailing force. My question to him is, from my perspective, at least Russian imperialism doesn't look any better if you look at how Russia controls Belarus and some of its client states. Chinese imperialism, if you want to look at it, you can also look at how uh, China controls Cambodia and how it uses its influence. It uses its influence within Cambodia and Laos vis-a-vis the rest of uh and to stop ASEAN taking a stronger position on the South China Sea. So vis-a-vis again China imperialism and its position on the South China Sea, where it says that uh, the whole South China Sea is mine and I'm the big brother. And if you want to have any sovereignty within that def- my definition, you have to out how to me or you have to be my smaller brother. I mean, I understand the flaws with Western imperialism, but if all forms of imperialism are bad, then what is to say that Western imperialism is not the best of a bunch of worse options? Well, Western imperialism is by far the most powerful imperialism that there is on planet Earth, okay? So let's, let's be clear about that. But the issue of, our, of our power relations is really the, 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 the question that you are raising, you know? Yeah, yeah, because, because uh, the, the if, if you, you are weak, if you are weak, you will be taken, you will be taken advantage of. Yeah, yeah so, so that's, that's it. it. So, so in part three, in part three, I'm talking, talking about how we can develop a, a much stronger regional economy. economy. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's the, the point. point. And, and, and if you are not, if you are not not strong regionally, you will be you you will be dominated. That's it. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe I'll just jump in and uh, just highlight that the Taiwan elections are due in January next year. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, I think it was King Su who mentioned that uh, the Americans love to play evangelists and interfere uh, with politics around the world and they want to push democracy in Taiwan. Uh, maybe a question to King Su. Do you think uh, the Americans will interfere with Taiwan elections next year? Of, of course, course, they are, are, they are interfering, interfering all the time, right? Yeah, but uh, but but think of the the Chinese reaction, uh, yeah, because the Americans uh, uh think that the Chinese will inevitably uh take a military will, will will militarily take over Taiwan. The Chinese are not that stupid, okay? So what they have done now is they have, they have increased the opportunities for Taiwanese to have a lot more security and a lot more uh, economic opportunities in China. So this is a, 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 the, the, the soft method of, 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 uh, of integration, right? In other words, the Chinese strategy is to make sure that Taiwan and China, Taiwanese people and Chinese people benefit mutually. So this is the strategy. It's not an American strategy. Americans are like cowboys. Eh? They only know how to use gun and shoot. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the Chinese China- are much more subtle. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, thousands, thousands of thousands of, thousands of years, years of, 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 of playing uh, strategic games, games, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think George Yo and uh, uh, Han Shi also agree with you, and they have a lot of dealings with the Chinese. Yeah. So, um, Marcus, uh, do you have any follow up to that? Uh, so sorry, I'm just listening to what you said. Um, uh, my counter reference point would probably be um yes uh we have to find our own way we have to be more economically dependent but independent from, economically but independent independent but from my yeah. perspective entirely if the highest level of technology comes from the west and we want to be a technologically advanced nation for economic development uh, no, 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 no. The, the chinese technology is a lot better now don't worry about that it's, no, no, going it be, is... it's going to be a competition, technological competition. I sorry, just let me uh come to the nub of it. Yes, the Chi- yes, the Chinese are catching up, but on the other hand, currently the cutting edge is still with the West. Now, whether or not they catch up within the next 20 years and surpass the West in the next 30 years, 
is up for grabs. But if you're talking about the here and now, then the question becomes um then the question becomes we will still be economically dependent on the West and we cannot be technologically independent of the West because the best and the largest advances are still in the West. Um, I say this, I, I'm saying this based on the fact that I am doing a lot of business with China. So I've seen the areas that they have caught up, they are trying to improve, but I also see the areas where the West is still, up, is still much ahead of them. So it's just a question of finding the balance Maybe in 30 years, I can't say, but for now, I would just like to remind mm. people that the West is still, I mean, you take a look at the, at their flagship projects, aviation, co uh, the COMAC, half of the engines are from the West. The Chinese build the airframe, but the avionics, hydraulics, the highest, the highest components, which are high tech, are all from the West. So it is that level of, it is that level of engineering. Yeah, on that point alone, uh, the, the new new developments in the uh, uh, impeller designs by the Chinese, right? They have increased the the efficiency of the of the turbojet engine by twenty percent because they have a better design of the intake uh, uh, propellers. Okay, so this this is the kind of uh, thing, and 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 in the end, it's not an either or situation. No, it is a uh, a uh, combination of you know you take from here you take from there you know you 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 play the 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 it, it's not a balancing game but you play the opportunistic game but you can only play that opportunistic game when you have a, a strong enough basic economy right which if we were in malaysia we would have had that that that's what Lee Kuan Yew wanted right but now we have to go beyond that we have to think about an eco regional economy right capitalizing on the on the capital and and and, and technological uh, uh, resources that we have right and um we we have to be, we have to play the the role of a catalyst for the for the uh, economic enhancement of the entire region right we are we are we are thinking too small uh, sorry yeah. i also think that imperialism will come in any form yeah. if we let china be our big partner in many fields, then China will also dictate and direct. Right, yeah. So it is better, whether it's America, BRICS is also quite good. Uh, in my view, it's a diversion to uh, having another partner and, and China. But I, I think how we state what we want out of them without uh, lowering our own standards when it comes for me, especially when it comes to how uh, deals are made, minerals uh, are used and how waste is cleared, all that you have to become a more global player because we are we are supporting climate change so strongly, right? So we have to be that kind of a player globally and must take charge because I can't see China or America both um, really being that keen on on uh, certain material raw materials and partners that they work with it will be hard or any country uh, for that matter i think everyone has to be careful on how partner deals are struck and also in that same vein i would ask where does singapore stand because we 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 got upset with Myanmar and the junta and everything, but we, we stand opposed to imposing sanctions and we have huge investments in Myanmar. So you talked about ideology and all that earlier. I think it would be good to have this as a forward Singapore discussion. Where do Singaporeans think all this ought to be? And also maybe in part three, because we cannot run away from certain uh, mm. ethical dimensions when you uh, that and and the, and right now we are facing many conflicts in the world and what's our positioning in the Israel Gaza thing we have made it clear but it is going on and now it's a debacle it's a massive massacre so where do we stand on trade all this will come up uh, okay so, uh, sorry, we really stretched our time. It's supposed to <laughs> finish at 9.30. Um, but uh, I'm going to ask all the commentators and the uh, uh, Prof. Do you have any closing remarks? Oh, wait. Uh, one, 
a question. I think the last question uh, from Mr. HK. Uh, why the West isn't better in infrastructure construction? So uh, he's implying that uh, they are not the best, but uh, he's saying we can use aviation as a gauge to reach out to the West far better than the Chinese. So basically just uh, repeating what King Sun mentioned earlier about uh, getting the best of both worlds. So uh, any closing remarks from uh, the commentators? I'll start with you, Brema. Well, I, I would say thank you for doing all the hard work, uh, Prof King Sun, from part one, part two, and then part three, and Alfred. I think these are good discussions to have. And I, I hope more people will come and be part of this kind of, I, I think it's an opener, opening and reflecting and thinking harder on a few things. I think that's very good. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Bima. I also want to do a quick uh, uh, sell uh, for our new Friday Conversations YouTube channel, which was just launched last uh, week. So yes, just uh, search Friday Conversations in YouTube. You should be able to see our videos. Uh, some of the things mentioned in this talk were actually repeated by, for example, Mr. James Comes, uh, mm. who talk about the uh, foreign mm. talent and uh, uh, also the 40%, 45% uh, foreign workforce in Singapore. He did mention that in his talk. Mm. And also the technical forum where I think the few people, experts in fintech, which is one of the uh, areas that the Singapore government is pushing. A lot of people don't understand fintech. Uh, go to that video to understand a bit more. Uh, and okay, so Mr. Balji, any closing remarks from you? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it very, very, very short. The central theme, especially with uh, Ping Soon's uh, one hour statement, the central point is what is what is Singapore all about in the future? I mean, and I think the time has kind of uh, passed to make that call anymore you know, because of so many changes that have happened around mm -hmm. the world, so many of the restrictions that Singapore has. I think my, my final point is that I really see that our future, and I'm talking about future in the next 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. I see a very bleak future. Sorry to sorry to end the night, you know, on such a uh, yeah, okay. I, I, I want to I want to jump in here, you know, uh, because uh, I'll be covering this in part three as well. So we might as well uh, uh, this a, pre a prelude to it, right? I had a long meeting with a, a very senior official in the Tamasek, okay? And uh, my proposition was, uh, uh, is it possible to raise $1 trillion uh, in, in order to use it as a, as a catalyst to, to uh, develop the economy of Southeast Asia? And the, and the reply from this expert was, it's not a problem. Because with Singapore's AAA financial status, we can, we can borrow any amount of money, okay? Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's $17 trillion doing nothing in existing offshore accounts. And they are paying them uh, half percent to keep their money safe and their identity secret. If we offer 1%, the money will all come to us. The question then arose in the discussion with the domestic official is that who is capable in Singapore of using this money effectively and honestly? And my my. And my, my re reply to that is nobody. So this is our problem. We are a very, we are a very uh, a weak people. We, we're not very capable, right? So we need to increase our capability really fast. Otherwise, we are going to be done for. And I, I want, right, through, through developing our, I call enterprise campuses, if you want to change the education system and the political system, Right. Let's take the education system in the school system. Right. You will get results uh, within 36 years, 18 plus mm -hmm. times two. OK. But if you change the culture in our universities, you can get results within five years, 10 mm -hmm. years. OK. So that's where you must start. So the enterprise campus is the strategic uh, uh, brainpower uh, uh, development center. 
right? But to do that, to do that requires very bold political leadership. Do we have that? If we don't have that, we really have to tell them to, to buck up. They're not good enough. Uh, okay. Uh, Tisun, any closing remarks? Who? Tisun, Tisun, Tisun. Yeah, yeah. You are part of the panelists. Okay. I, I, I basically have one closing remark re regarding this. So it's quite important that when we, if we want to unpack and understand the govern, government narrative, we need to understand a lot of uh, like what? A lot of things. Let me give you an example. For example, I hear a lot of people talking about technology will be the new industry, this kind of thing. But to me, coming from a technical guy, technology is never an industry. Technology, like the internet, are just enabling the industries. And if the industry are not moving, whatever technology you have is useless. So it's very important to understand what each industry goes through. It's just like you talk about, okay, the best, best uh, when we look at the internet, is Amazon that, that really move and it, these are the internet company or even Alibaba. But the issue is because at that point of time, e-commerce has become, commerce has become, the, because it has enabled commerce to become a very, uh, very useful industry. So this is very important. When we look at the, when we hear about things like, okay, scale future, this kind of thing and so on. So at the same time, we must understand what is each of our industry doing and how are we approaching it and where are the growth that we are talking about. That's all I have to say. Maybe something for King Soon to ponder about in the part three. It's very simple. You need to put money. You need to put money together with brains. And then the technology will be productive. Right, right now, we, we, we can have the money, but we don't have the brains. That's a problem. Okay. Uh, really, <laughs> sorry, everyone. I really, really uh, have to pause here and uh, uh, finish up because uh, it's almost 10 o'clock already. So can I ask uh, everybody to turn on their videos? We're going to do a screenshot of the uh, whole audience. Uh, let me just unmute and pin everybody. Hold on. Okay, let's have a... Uh, Audrey, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Um, let me just uh, get everybody's uh, portrait Turn up. on your video. Turn on your video. Yes, everyone, please uh, turn on your video so that we can nice <laughs> a uh, screenshot. Joseph, you want to put on a shirt? <laughs> Somebody has got nice legs. <laughs> oh. uh, now I see the face. <laughs> Mr. Neo, nice to see you again. Uh, Marcus, you I know you're very camera shy. La. Up to you. Yeah, so uh yeah. Um, Mr. C and Mr. Lapis, please, yeah. Wow, see, you're already in the dark. I uh, you know safe power. Thank you uh yeah, Lynn, would you like to come on as well and uh seat? Yeah, can't can't really see you. Uh we see a, a shadow dark room, yeah. Okay, it's so, okay, la. yeah. Uh, okay, so I think we will just uh take a picture. So everybody, if you don't mind, right, please smile. Uh, I'll take a few. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, uh, everyone, please smile. Okay, if you want to give a thumbs up or if you want to give a uh hearts up, that'll be nice. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, and tune in again for part three, tentatively 5th of January 2024. So uh, good night, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.